everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Happy 2023. And yes, cheers. Exciting to be back with Wine for Bet Street. We took a little break over the holidays uh, because, well, you know, everybody's busy over the holidays. <laughs> but we are back in 2023 with a great variety that I think everybody is going to be so excited to learn about. I know I am. And it is Andarabi, Undarabi Zuri. Did I say that correctly, Rick? Very, I very mean. close. <laughs> right. And if we are talking Spain and Spanish grades, <sighs> who, of course, are we going to go to? But we are going to go to the Spanish wine guy, Rick Fisher. So welcome, Rick. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And happy Our 2023 pleasure. to you. Likewise. And yes. And um, this is officially my, this will be my first full year of being a Spanish wine scholar. Yay. Congrats again. <laughs> Yay. I was a nervous wreck, studied my <laughs> butt off <laughs> and passed with honors. And I'm so, ex I'm so thrilled to have done that and a very quick plug. The program is incredible. So everybody should check it out. The 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 program was absolutely incredible. For me, Rick was the difference because I don't think I would have done anywhere near as well if I just was reading a book and doing things on my own. But to have those weekly sessions to be able to ask questions with you, Rick, was outrageous for me. So stellar program. I would stand up, but then you can see I'm wearing pajama bottoms. <laughs> <laughs> And Rick and I were talking about having no pants on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gotta love these things. Anyway, welcome everybody to Wine for Bet Street. I am your co-host, Lori. I am owner of Dracina Wines and Paso Robles. I am a wine writer, wine educator, wine podcaster, uh, all under exploring the wine glass. And I am excited to be here and start 2023 with the letter H and my co-host, Debbie. I'm Debbie G. Aquindo. I'm known as the Hudson Valley Wine Goddess. I'm a wine writer, wine educator, an author of Tapping the Hudson Valley. I'm a certified, uh, certified specialist of wine, wine location specialist in Port and Champagne, and a certified cherry wine specialist. And I'm partner in a restaurant in North Wildwood, New Jersey called Trio North Wildwood, and I could have left something out, but that's about it. <laughs> I know I can handle right now. <laughs> Trust me. And our special guest, Rick Fisher. Hello. Hello. Thanks for having me on today. Uh, my name is Rick Fisher. I am the Spanish Programs Director for the Wine Scholar Guild. And you heard uh, Lori talk about the Spanish Wine Scholar Program. I created the program. Uh, it's been taught uh, by a, over, been teaching it for about three and a half years, and we've had more than 1,200 people go through the program, uh, which is so fun for me. Um, as a matter of fact, um, we're teaching it in Malaga in April this year. Nice. So I'm going to be teaching it uh, for a week in Malaga, so that's going to be a lot of fun. But I am, um, uh, as in 2021, I finished my diploma with WSET. Um, I'm a certified educator for uh, Rioja, Cava, and Sherry. Uh, wine judge, wine writer, we all have a long list of stuff, but we, you know, ultimately it comes down to talking about wine because that's what we love to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. And of course, drinking it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. All right. So we're going to go to Elmo here. And um, oh, Rick, if you can just mute until it's over, we've learned that that eliminates the echo. I don't know how you guys can sit there straight-faced and watch that 
<laughs> and every time it, I think Debbie sees it new every time because they the stupid program people keep changing the program I use to make it. So I have to keep doing find new ways to kind of do it. But it's, it's, so, cute. Cute. it's so cute, but I was trying not to giggle during the <laughs> <laughs> He's so cute. And, you know, Elmo is all about education, and that's what Wine for Bed Street is all about. So that's right. Fun and education. Yes. So I'm excited. I have my glass of Untarabi Zuri. <laughs> I have my glass. And raise it, and I will say slancha. And have Cheers. A Salud. Day. Mm. Mm. Ugh, yum. Oh, oh wow. wow. Yum, yum. Woo! Zippy. Yeah. Uh, yes. Beat me to it. Definitely yep. zippy. So, like, <clears throat> that is like a punch of citrus fruit in your mouth. I'm salivating. I got a lot wow. of salinity in mine. Yeah. Yeah. So good. So amazing. So, let's get into learning about this grape variety. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, Deb, I think you're up first. Oops, am I? I think you are. <laughs> okay. We could all think you, because we already covered my my topic. Oh, my mine. Well, so why don't I it. give you guys a little well, bit of a background as to where the grape comes from? All right. Well, let okay. me well, okay, go ahead. The we just were gonna we were gonna talk about um the last time you were on, we talked oh. about Zarello. And well with the back your background, but we already did that. Okay. All right. We'll go. So uh, we, why don't we start off? Why don't we start off with a little background of Zarello, and then we'll get into uh, under Ruby Zuri, which is the last time you were with us. A little background of, of Zarello, the, of the yes. grape. Yes. Like, is there any relationship to what we're going to talk about today? Absolutely not. All right. That's good it, to with know. With the exception of that, it's a white grape. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Zarello, um, you know, is is the native grape of the Penedes region in Catalonia. Um, and even though they're, I mean, they're still, not, they're actually not very close together. Yeah. You know, we've got to cross Aragon and cross Navarra and get to País Vasco and to get uh, and up to the coast for here. So um, they, they are both light and white refreshing grapes. So um, we'll kind of leave their, their similarities at that point. At that bit. All right. Well, let's talk about Undarati Zuri, which is actually the main grape variety, as you were saying, in País Vasco, uh, which is also in Spain. So can you give us a little information about País Vasco, like where it is, what its climate like, and, you know, the the autonomous region itself? Yeah, so, and so País Vasco, or Basque country, uh, as it's translated, is one of Spain's 17 autonomous regions. And it's situated on the northern coast of Spain. It's uh, it's part of what they call Green Spain because it's really rainy and it's really super green. So Green Spain is all the way from the western coast, from Galicia to Asturias, Cantabria, and then to País Vasco. País Vasco um, is actually located, part of it, it borders France. on the, uh, And then up in the north, you have the Bay of Biscay. Okay, which is technically part of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, climatically, as I mentioned, it's very wet. And so it is definitely a maritime climate. Uh, parts of, of the Basque country actually have some of the highest rainfall in all of Spain. And, um, and País Vasco is actually three different provinces uh, that, that, uh, that uh, make, the, make it up. But technically, Basque country is there are seven provinces, and so three provinces in País Vasco, Navarra, which is the neighbor to the west, was all is also a Basque um, region, and then three provinces in southwestern France. Um, uh, in, in one of the regions, there is a Rulagai that um that is actually that's bass so a lot of the there's a lot of overlap in in grape and 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 some of that kind of stuff when you're talking about bass country and it's kind of cool that it's in the two different countries yeah i never i never knew it was part in spring in, um, yeah and one of the fun things yes. about 
about the Basque, the Basque country too, is there's a book that I highly recommend. It's called A Basque History of the World. And, and it talks about, um, I think the author, I think is Mark Kurlansky. And um, they talk about the Basque people and, and they're, I mean, technically nobody knows the origins of their language. There's no uh, connection to any written language that we have. And the people are actually believed to have been the first people to occupy Western Europe. And so, I mean, they're, I mean, they're obviously, I mean, like, like other parts of Spain, like the Catalans or whatever, that, I mean, they're very proud and whatnot, but they're just a fascinating, it's a fascinating region, fascinating people as we go through today. And, you know, we talk about the, the wines and the food. It's just, it's an amazing, amazing place. So. Awesome. Yeah. So I've, Anur Zarabi Zuri is also known as Chocoli. Um, now, things that I read, there was Chocoli was a DO. There was like three different DOs, different parts of Chocoli. But why do they label it Chocoli rather than just the name of the grape, Hana Zuri? Yeah, it, it's a great I think it confuses people. It, it probably does. And it's a really good question, Debbie. In, in many ways, it's no different than a lot of people saying that Rioja is a grape, you know? Sure. <laughs> and and so um, technically, Hondra Bizuri is not, um, is, it's not the same as Chocoli. Hondra Bizuri is the grape, Chocoli is the wine style. Okay. And, and so it is technically a style. It is actually the name um, of three uh, regions. So you've got um, uh, Guitariaco, Chocolina, Biscaico Chacolina and Arabaco Chacolina. Exactly. I have the Catalato. And they are, I mean, they're all, they're list, they're always on the label right. in some, some way, shape, or form. Um, and so the 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 name Chocoli is actually really believed to have originated from a Basque word, um, Echacoa, which basically means made at home. And so Chocoli was a style of wine or is a style of wine that was generally made made at home oh. um and and if you if you visit uh the basque country like places like in particular like san sebastian on the northern coast or bilbao or some of those kind of uh, guitaria and you go into these these uh taverns or these these pinchos bars or whatever a lot of times you see that they'll have these huge tanks and they'll actually pour the chocolate so they, i mean these were like made at home wines they're they, they were, you know, very artisan styled wines now, and they've, they've gained a tremendous popularity around the world, in particular in the U.S., because um, they're like, you know, what we call a porch pounder. Yes. Yes, so, I can see that. Yeah. In, is there any differences on the three different types of chocolate? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, so it, it really depends. So in... Um, in, in the three, the two coastal ones are Biscaico and Guitariaco. Um, they sit on the coast, so they're, they tend to be very, very similar. They both have a lot more of the same influences. And then the third province, so the two provinces sit at the top, and then the, the Alaba province sits below it. As a matter of fact, part of Rioja is in the Alaba province. And, um, but the, the, the Chocolate region is at the north part of that province. And so Arabaco Chocolina. Um, there it tends to be a little more continental. So it's a little drier. Um, the wines tend to be a little bit fuller. Um, and, uh, and so, but generally the wines are, are similarly influenced. Most of the vast majority of wines that we see in the States are from the two Northern ones. They're the two biggest producers by far. I, I think I've only seen a couple of of wines from Arabaco um, in okay. the U.S. And you you said that the that the name itself is thought to have been a Basque a Basque name. Um, is it is it native to Pais Vasco or can it is it grown in other <laughs> regions in Spain also? Yeah, it's it's a really um, that's a very loaded question, Lori. Um, <laughs> We're in, good at in that. that. In that. <laughs> Uh, Hondra, and, and you'll you'll see it pronounced and written in two different ways. You'll see it as Hondurabi Zuri or Honduribi Zuri. Both are are technically are used, and 
Jantis Robinson uses Honda Ribizuri. Um, so that's, you know, we kind of use her as, you know, the wine grapes as the Bible. Um, <clears throat> but the grape itself is not even technically a grape. It was named after um, the town of Honda Ribia. And it's the, it was the primary white grape that was grown in this area. And, and when they started to do a lot of research and DNA uh, research on these grapes, Hundry Missouri is actually um, Corbu Blanc from southwestern France. And oh. so, um, so there's, I mean, there, it, it's interesting because there's another grape um, in the Chocolaty regions uh, called Hundry Missouri Zeradia. And that's Petit Corbu. And so you've got these, these uh, connections, but, you know, everybody refers to the grapes because even though they are DNA, technically exactly the same grape, they still refer to them in Spain by their, by their you know, their synonym as Hungry Buzuri. And there's also a red grape, too, um, un completely unrelated, <laughs> named, named after the town. And that, that is, I mean, I think Americans, we like our things nice and simple, right? We like Cab Franc, Cab Sauv, you know, <laughs> Chardonnay. Um, I think we get confused very easily and people shy away from it. And that's what like Debbie was saying earlier is like, she, you know, the concept that like this on the front label does not say on the Ravi Sori at all. Mm -hmm. right? It's got the Jetarico Chocolini, but then on yeah, the mine, it, mine doesn't either. You have to read the back of the bottle. Yeah. And then the back says 100%, the right? 100%. Right. But people don't know. Right. So they, they see Spanish white. What is this? It's chocolate. Yeah. If they can even pronounce it because. Exactly. And, and, that's a, and that's a, that's a great point. And I mean, the pronunciation. And is it a region? Is it a grape? You know, but that's what we're here for to tell yeah. you all about mm -hmm. it. And, it's, and, 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 and that's one of the things that, that does make, you know, I mean, this, you know, Spain is, you know, the, the Basque country is not unique to anywhere else in the world right. in doing the, in, in confusing people you know, with that. And so I think they've kind of rallied around the the concept of Chocoli because it differentiates them from, you know, every other place and every other, even even these grapes, Corbu Blanc and Petit Corbu in, in Southwestern France, you know, because <clears throat> those grapes, you know, tend to be made more in the traditional white style. Whereas here, I mean, you guys have both tasted these now, that lighter, fresher, zippier, more saline, mm -hmm. you know, style of wine. Is is there a consortio for them? There's there are three. The each, individual they each have each their own province has their own, own. Um, consejo regulador exactly. Okay. And so it's a very low alcohol. Mine is eleven. Debbie, you said yours is eleven. Eleven point five. Okay. Mine's eleven is, also. Is that a regulation within? No, no. Not, not necessarily. Um, okay. I mean, I believe the minimum, they do have to meet at least 10 and a half, I believe. Okay. Don't quote me on that. I'm almost positive that's the case. But um, but generally this, you know, the, the style, you know, uh, the reason why it tends to be lower alcohol, I mean, there's a couple of reasons in the fact that, okay. you know, the grapes take, you know, are, are it's difficult to ripen the grapes in, in this really in climate, right? In this climate. And so you tend to have grapes with higher acidity um, because, you know, when they're picked and uh, and then the way that they actually process it, I mean, they're processed generally in stainless steel. Um, and then uh, the, um, to get that that um, effervescence in there. They generally stop, they, they, they actually um, close the tank, the fermentation tanks on the stainless steel right before fermentation is complete to help um, hold in that residual CO2. Oh, wow. And, and so some producers, I mean, I would say these are definitely like maybe producers we don't see bottled because they're not high the high quality ones, will pump CO2 to give a little bit of that. But quality wines like the ones that we're drinking, it's part of it's part of the winemaking process where they're actually able to capture that final residual CO2 that gives you that kind of, you know, effervescent, uh, frizzy kind of kind of uh, notes. Very cool.
So I was going to show before we go, and I was going to, I was telling Debbie beforehand, I mean, I brought a couple of props with me. Um, and I, I always think these are really fun, especially if you're going to drink chocolate. So there, there are in, in the chocolate region, this is, they use these little spouts, these little pourers. Because what happens is chocolate, one of the things that happens with chocolate when you generally, when you pour it, like if you're in a tavern in the Basque country, they, they will open a spout and hit the glass like with the, the shooting wine or they'll pour from a high, um, uh, their arm up high because when the, when the wine hits the glass, it helps to aerate it and creates more of those bubbles. And so what they've done is they've created these little spouts. Now this this one's a little a little small for this this one, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna act, I'm gonna hold it. But generally, what they do is when they pour is they pour like this. So it allows so you can see that that fizzy, and it kind of creates that uh, you know that 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 idea of when of when pouring. I was in I was in the Basque Country last year at a producer and we did the whole thing with, they open the tank and you have a glass up next to it and you hold your glass all the way out while they're still, it's, it's so cool. <laughs> it's so cool. Now this, this isn't the region that has the special glass too, is it? Um, they do use, I should have brought one. I've got one in the kitchen. It, it looks more like, um, <clears throat> it, it's like a, like a highball glass. Okay. round and it's real thin glass but it's just a round glass and and it it has a, a wide a wider base than like a traditional okay. wine glass does so it hit when it's hitting the bottom you might be thinking the other region is ribeiro which has the same glasses but they're really short oh, okay um but in chocolate they're they're kind of a tall tall like a highball and the way that they would drink them which is really fun is they would generally would drink um, you know, they would drink something and then they, they would pass it to somebody else and they would turn the glass and they would, you know, so like three or four people are drinking off the same glass, but in a different spot, right. they would leave a little bit left in the bottom of the glass. And the last person would take the glass and swirl it and throw it out. And that would clean the rim with the remaining wine um, so that you could pour again and start yeah. over again. And that was all pre-COVID. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now there's straws. No. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That is awesome. <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, do you? Oh, Deb. I'm sorry. It's you again. It's I'm off. Again. I'm okay. off. I'm off tilt tonight. I'm sorry. You are off tilt. Do we? Well, no. Actually, it's you. But um, <clears throat> we're name. Did we discuss the name of the grape? Yes. Where it yes. came from? Okay, that's what we. That's where we all we, when we off went off on tangents. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I am so I'm so easy to take somebody down a rabbit hole. So oh, you, you, have to, you have to just kind of pull so, it back out again. The rabbit so, holes are awesome. I'm big with the squirrels. Squirrels. <laughs> who's, <laughs> who's the dad? Who are the parents? Do we know? Do we know who the parents of these grapes are? Do they have any type of origin or? Um, I actually, uh, I I actually tried to research that, and of course, the I had to be. I was looking for Corbu Blanc, and there's, I mean, I couldn't find any anything yeah. that um, that mentioned DNA. I mean, Jancis has nothing about it. I mean, researching it, I couldn't find a damn. Yeah, I couldn't either. On. I mean, which is crazy. Um, now. If you're looking at, and we, I know we talked a little bit at the beginning about the red grape, Hungary mm -hmm. Belta, and Belta means, Zuri, so Zuri means white right. in the Basque language. And so Honduribia was the town, Zuri is white, and then the same for Honduribia, and then Belta is red in, in, uh, in the Basque language. And so that uh, is a little different. We do um, know one of the parents, and that is Cabernet Franc of uh Hondri Hondri Bibelza. And as a huge fan of of uh Cabernet Franc, it's really fun. And I actually had a bottle to show you guys. Um this is uh, it's a little hard because of the mm -hmm. of the but you can and so this is a producer Donien Gorondona um and they had they do this is a hundred percent um Hondri Hondri Bibelza. And you do get those 
herbal, you know, cab franc notes. It's the really fun, super fun wines. Oh. And I, I highly encourage, you know, sometimes this is where the rabbit hole becomes a benefit where you start hunting for these <laughs> kinds of things. And there um, it's, it's really, but that, I mean, the, the, I mean, Cap Franc is, is a parent to so many um, he grapes. He did get around. Yeah, he did. Mm -hmm. um, but it actually, it's, it's a really, um, it's fun to be able to see that, that influence because, you know, we, I mean, we have our, our, we have borders now, but what were borders, you know, right. I mean, the Pyrenees mountains, it, you got over the Pyrenees and you were somewhere else, you know, it yeah. wasn't technically France and Spain, or maybe it was at some point, but you know, and so it's fun to see that with those grapes, but to the white grapes, nah. <laughs> wow. It, is it, do we see it any place else? Can we get this in the United States? Not, not the wine, the grapes. Um, I have not, I'm trying to think because being in California, there's always somebody trying to do something different. Right. And, um, I mean, I'm seeing producers now growing Mencia, growing Godeo, growing. Wow. Yeah. I, yeah. Um, you know, not for anything, but just talking about where the scrape grows, I'm wondering, and I'm going to bring this up to some people in the Hudson Valley. I wonder if this will grow well in the Hudson Valley with the proximity to the Atlantic ocean and the water. And yeah, if you have that really climate. strong maritime climate yeah, and, and, uh, and it, and, it, and I think it, I or think, it's, prob I think it's prob probably a good call, Debbie, because I mean, if you look at, I mean, there the the parts of the Basque Country get snow. Um, well, Alberino grows really well in the Hudson Valley. Yeah. Matt from Ben Morrow or Fjord grows in Alberino, and it's really good. And I'm picky. I mean, I'm very that. critical. <laughs> you know, I have to try, I'll have to try that because I really, I mean, one of the things that I love to do is to see Spanish grapes being grown in the U.S. And I'll seeing, send you a you know, bottle. I, I might have a bottle. And he, ha he, um, he has it sparkling, but it's not released. But I have a bottle of that. Okay. But I'll get with him and I'll... That'd be cool. We'll I mean, but, it, but it's fun. But, but to your point, uh, Lori, I, I haven't seen this grape planted anywhere in the U.S. Um, that doesn't mean somebody's doesn't have yeah. an acre or a half an acre, you know, hidden somewhere. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure somebody is playing. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure. With this name. Yeah, yeah, that's so cool. Um, all right. So in general, like we talked about what we tasted a little bit. We'll go a little further into it, but like Zippy comes to mind. You yeah. know, the citrus, the the salinity. Or is that, you know, you talked a little bit about the two the two different um, DOs that are up more north and then the one that's out in the continental. But if you had to describe this to somebody who has never tasted it before, what would you say would be a general characteristic that they can expect? And is there potentially a grape variety they're more familiar with that might be, a, oh, it's if you like this, you might like on Darabi Zuri? Mm, that's a great question. Um, so first off, easily enough, I mean, and you can, as soon as you taste it, you get, it's crisp, it's refreshing, it's high acid. I mean, it's like, it is like, you know, teeth gnawing acidity, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and, and I, you know, the, I mean, I'm now I'm drinking a, a, a Rosado which is 50% Zuri and 50% Belza. But you, but even here, I still get um, the floral. There's floral notes. I mean, generally in the ones you guys have will be white flowers. Um, there are notes of citrus and saline in particular because them both being so close to, I mean, a lot of the, I mean, a lot of the vineyards, um, I mean, basically are, are to the edge of, of, the, of the cliffs where, you know, where the Bay of Biscay is. And I remember the, the producer that I visited, we walked through their vineyards and, and you just hear that you could hear the, the waves crashing, wow. you know, um, and these and these grapes are, these vines are sitting right there at the edge. Um, but those, you know, you get those, they're really super mineral driven, um, the, the, the white and the rosé both. 
because they're both made the same way. But in, this- in a, a, a great, I'm sorry, and, and then a, something that I would say probably a, like a really light, a lighter styled Chenin Blanc. Okay. Um, maybe because of that really refreshing acidity and the minerality. Um, or, or even if you're staying in Spain, I would go to the other coast and I'd go to go to Albarino. You know, I mean, I think that because of those, you get more, you get those saline notes. Mm-hmm. Those tend to be a little fuller body than these. Obviously, these are like super light. Very um, light. Which, which is like we were talking earlier that, um, I mean, this is like a, a bottle of water that's just <laughs> yeah. waiting to be consumed. <laughs> right. Absolutely. And so it's, I, it's very refreshing, especially, I mean, here we are in the middle of winter, but on a hot summer day. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's a great pool wine too. So, yeah. um, you know, we, we always have, um, I always have a, a five or six bottles of chocolate, especially night. spring springtime. <laughs> <laughs> Have you been, you got a camera going on in here or what? Um, but I mean, it's always, because it's such a, it's such a great wine um, and it's super light. You don't, you know, you don't feel, it doesn't fill you up. It doesn't feel, you know, I don't know. There's just something about it that's so unique to any wine in the world that, um, you know, so. I, I kind of correlated to, although I don't know how common this is either, but uh, a prettier pick pool. Yeah, okay. I can see that. I can see that too. Yeah. You know, because to me, I mean, and I love pick pool, but to me, pick pool is very one dimensional. It's got the acid, it's light, it's that citrusy is in there. But this is a more feminine version. It's It's got the acidity in it, but it, and it, it is zippy, but it's not that lip stinger that that pick pool is and it's just the the white flowers that are in here the you know and the more salinity to me it makes me think of a, a prettier a more you know sexy pick pool yeah i i, I think chocolate would would uh would gladly don the 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 term sexy so um <laughs> <laughs> uh, awesome so why don't you tell us about what you are tasting because you sure. you you have the two, and are they are they married together frequently? Uh, for Rosado, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, and and this particular producer um, is um, so this is Amos Toy. Um, I mean, really, truly, one of one of the 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 countries and one of the region's best chocolate producers. Um, this is their Rosado, and then this is their uh, their white. This one's 100% Andre Missouri, and then as I mentioned before, this is a 50/50 with the the red grape and and Andre Missouri. Um, it's it's a and everything is it's farmed uh, organically. Um, they're using indigenous yeast uh, in in the fermentation process, and uh, they hand harvest all the grapes. I mean, it's, and you kind of have to, in this, in these, this, this is from Gatayaco, so on the coast. And these vineyards that grow on the coast, they generally grow in, in a, in a pergola system, okay. but not a, not the same pergola that you tend to see in Rias Baixas, where in Rias Baixas, you see these pillars and these wires that go cross across mm-hmm. the top. And um, the, the way that these pergolas are, is they're kind of more like this. And so they grow up and the grapes hang from the pergola here. Oh. And um, and that and that's really important because of the high amount of moisture. It helps to keep the airflow going so the grapes don't get mildewed um, and those types of things. And so that's where that's why I mean you, you everything has to be hand harvested. You just can't you can't mechanically pick those kinds of grapes. Um, and because you do tend to have varying levels of ripeness as well, because of the the unique you know um, climate that it's in. So, um, but this this one is actually the grapes are actually co they're blended they're co fermented together. Um, they're they're um, 
it, which is which is really interesting because I mean technically that would make it a claret day, um, co you know co um, co macerated and co fermented, but um, yeah. So I mean for me that it's in this one you do get a little bit of those kind of like strawberry notes you know because of the of the the belza that's part of that. It's inc it's incredible to like how they do that like just the concept so first of all, i mean they can't it, like co-fermenting to me like it makes more sense when you're doing like a field blend type thing you're just taking everything um but these have to these have to ripen at different times so yeah. are they are they starting the fermentation of the zuri and then adding uh, i mean it could be, to be honest, like a 50 50 I, mix it, it is, is it a 50 50 man it is 50 50 and they just put all the grapes in together and 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 to be honest i'm trying to think uh, i mean i don't know how far apart i'm trying to think because this is a later it's just kind of a it's a late budding and a mid ripening grape oh, okay so um and cab franc is earlier is a little earlier, um, you know, so Belts is going to be, you know, should be similar in that regard. So um, they may actually, they actually pick them both around the same time right. period. If not, they may actually just keep them in a, in a cooler, but, right. um, but it's not going to be that, that long, that, okay. that much of a difference. I saw that there was a question up here from, from Karen about um, what months do they normally harvest? Oh, there you go. And yeah. And so, I mean, because it is so cold, I mean, you're looking at later harvest. So you're looking at probably in the October, um, you know, September, late September to October, October. Um, especially in the coastal areas. If you're in the Atabaco area where it's more continental, it's a little warmer, then they're going to be harvesting a little sooner. But um, generally, I mean, it, they're definitely um, in you know because and and the grapes are they're like the 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 zuri they're super small berries too so i mean i don't i don't know how i mean i i'm always amazed because viticulture is so foreign to me even though i've studied parts of it um i'm always amazed at at how they get everything just right you know right. um you've got a vineyard that has different influences and and, and all these kinds of things so yeah, I'm thinking maybe they maybe they're also doing di separate passes. So maybe they're harvesting they could be. the zuri for a white at one time, maybe leaving it on stem a little bit longer if they're going to make the rosato, and then they're harvesting the belsa maybe a little bit earlier for the rosato, and then so it could also be done through multiple passes. So. It, absolutely no it absolutely could and and i will say one of the things too about i mean the belta that i was telling you about because i've had um Amos toy also makes um also makes um a hundred percent belta um in 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 the same and it's in the riesling bottle as well it's the same the same uh bottle and um uh, but it's a dark bottle and and um and they still have that characteristic acid um of the region so you know because i mean in cabernet franc and other parts of the world you know when when it's it's going to ripen fairly quite fully whereas here you know you still have a, you still capture some of that acid from you know from from the grapes and the harvest very cool i'm all happy to learn something else about cabernet franc that you know I know you are. <laughs> you're the cab franc queen <laughs> there you go there you go. Awesome, I've awesome. got a goddess and I've got a queen. So. There you go. <laughs> hey. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, Rick, what is the relationship between Anna Zarabi Zuri and their Kruchin, the Corvu, Corvu Blanc, and I'm sure I'm not pronouncing them correctly, and Noah, and yeah, Noah so, from the south of France? Is there any yeah. type of relationship or? Um, I think I would say with just an overall, yes, they're all related in some way, shape or form, whether they're synonyms of each other, um, which is generally more the case. Um, you've got, as I mentioned before, you've got Handrabi, Handrabi Zuri, which is 
DNA with genetically the same as Corbu Blanc. You've got Hundre Vizuri Zaradia, which is genetically the same as Petit Corbu. Um, but Hundre Vizuri itself is also um, um, the synonym for the grape Crochin, as okay. well as the, the American hybrid Noah. Um, um, and there's a genetic connection to that as well. So Noah is an American hybrid. It's a, it's a, it's an American hybrid. Yes. Oh, no. Wow. Yeah, and so it sounds pretty American, Noah. We'll yeah, no, it, it, it does. It's like we're so we're so creative when we come up with the name something. Um, and and so I mean I don't know, I mean it, it, I mean and I I'm totally speculating at this point, but it, I mean who knows? It could be one of the one of the the. Um, the the great finds that that went with phylloxera that I don't, you know who knows you know um, for grafting but yeah I mean it's hard to know how all these grapes get you know I, I'm fascinated by the genetics of, of of grapes and and you know they're always learning you know we're always learning something new about them but it, but to your it's a long answer to say I don't know. Okay. Um. <laughs> well, you know, so many and grapes. I don't know that anybody does at this point. Yeah. Yes. You know, there's just so many grapes that have, I mean, literally, Cap Franc, I think, has 20 synonyms, you know, of where, you know, depending on where you are, what it's called. And right. that's one of the problems in the world of wine is that people think, because you know, oh, I'm getting this. And it ends up being the same that a same grape variety. They're just calling it different. And I, you know, I've I've read quite a bit that people, you know, how many synonyms there are, but you can't get rid of them. Yeah, I mean, am I, you know, like Tempranillo? How many names does Tempranillo yeah. have just within? <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, no, it's true. It's absolutely it's absolutely true. And 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 people, a lot of people only know that grape by its synonym. Right. They don't know it any other way. And, and so, I mean, that's where, that's where the struggle, you know, is as well. But, you know, fortunately the, you know, the longer we go and, you know, I, I mean, I'm, I've been dying for the new edition, for a new edition of, uh, of, um, of wine grapes, wine but I haven't seen anything on it yet because, you know, there's gotta be a gazillion updates to that. Since right that now. last one. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we're going to geek out a little bit. Um, so what, I mean, we know it's a maritime climate, but is there a specific like soil that that they like, or you know, you talked about potential for mildew. What are the the main things that a winemaker needs to pay attention to? And I don't know if you could answer this question or not, but like, there's usually some grapes are crazy in the vineyard and easy in the winery and others are kind of crazy in the winery and easy in the vineyard is you know is that yeah um so yes the they grow in soil um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sorry um, <laughs> that was good <laughs> um but generally i mean they're the the difference the different provinces have some similarities you tend to see a lot of um of uh, limestone subsoils um but you do see a lot of clay as well and um as well as you said see some alluvial soils as well and so you, the the soils for for the for the grapes uh, tend to be very um high in organic content and you know, and I think one of the, the if I was going to say if there were some struggles in the vineyard, uh, it would be the climate, and and having you know, and I mean, even if these grapes are growing on on the parals or the pergolas, I mean, you still have a lot of rainfall, you know, and and so the you know clay is not the you know tends to hold water as well, I mean, so you have to be very very careful there. And um, I mean, now they do get, you know, some hours of sunshine and, and whatnot during the day. And so it, it, generally it's not an issue, especially the way the grapes are growing. They're not growing close to the ground. They're not, you know, they're probably at about five or six feet above the ground. And so they definitely have a lot of airflow going through. Um, the, the grapes are, um, 
are high yielding. And so uh, they, you know, they're at this point, I don't know that they do any green harvesting or um, or anything like that. I haven't heard of it uh, because the yields tend to be fairly generous in the regulations. And um, and really, I mean, you're not producing a wine that needs to have low yields because it's going to age for five years and it's going to sit in the bottle for 20. You know, you're making a wine from, you know, grapes you just picked and you're putting them in the bottle and they're they're in somebody's glass within a year. Yeah. And, and so generally, you know, these these are now there are exceptions to that rule, of course, but but generally, you know, high yielding is good because they can produce more of this because they, I mean, they, the chocolate is so incredibly, has become so popular um, in Basque country. It's always been popular, but not and been around the world. It's just gaining in popularity at that point. So, um, so other than that, I think um, the, I mean, I would say those are probably the biggest um, potential issues working in the vineyard, in the winery. Um, from my understanding, the producer that I visited last year, um, it's a fairly easy grape to work with. It's not oxidative. It's not reductive. It's, you know, um, I almost feel like it's like, you know, going to the store and grabbing some green grapes in the bag <laughs> in the stainless steel tank, you know? I know it's not that easy. So if any chocolate producers ever watch this, please. That I was a joke. <laughs> um, but it, it's, uh, I, you know, it's, it tends to be a fairly um, baseline process, you know? I mean, and again, you're fermenting, you're going through alcoholic fermentation, and then you are capping the stainless steel tank, keeping the residual CO2, and you bottle it. So pretty much it doesn't see any oak or anything. It doesn't, does it spend time on its leaves? It's fermented in, in tanks and then yeah, so, bottle? Yeah, so I mean, and that's a really good question because it's one of the things that, you know, a lot of regions traditionally were just, you know, super light, you know, I mean, and this, you kind of go through this with Albarino where it's like now you see all these crazy things coming out of, out of Rias Baixas. And the same thing is true here. 99% <clears throat> is going to be this style that, that you're, you know, that we're drinking, but there are producers that are, and that are doing uh, lees aging. There are producers that are, that are toying with oak. And I would say generally what you're going to see in those, you're looking more like Fudras or large format barrels. Okay. Small barrels will not, will not be kind to this kind of a wine, but, um, I have over the past couple of weeks, I've been kind of lucky. I, I love, I mean, I'm, I'm obsessed when it comes to finding new and different things. And so I collect um, and sometimes I, I actually open. Um, <laughs> but this, uh, this is from that producer that does the red, Doña Gorondona. It's called Edie, I-R-I. And this is a 100% Henri Missouri that's aged five months on the leaves. Okay. And it does not have that effervescence. So it's actually more of that white wine process okay. that you go through. Um, and this is actually from Biscayco, which actually has had a tremendous amount of changes in the last uh, couple of years. But this is, it's free run juice um, and, and absolutely fantastic. I you think we'll not... see any, anything in a cement tank? I would not be surprised at all. Okay. Not at all. Uh, cement tanks actually, um, a lot of producers like cement for fermentation um, because it's neutral. Okay. And and so, and I I, I would not be surprised even to see amphora um, okay. in in some of these kinds of in some of these kinds of things. But I think that you're seeing these regions. I mean, they've kind of mastered this style now. And now they, they're making their money on this style, but it gives them the ability to now try um, and work with, with some other, other types of, of uh, styles. So you had said that it's real, I mean, and it obviously is meant to be drunk young. These, my, mine is a 2021, uh, so it's, it's meant to be drunk young. But with, 
do the DOs have the regulation? So if they're going to play with the lees, if they're going to play with with the barrels or the fudras and stuff, does the DO, um, would they Regulate still be that? able to label that? Yeah. So yeah. that's that's actually a really good question and a perfect segue to, um, so this this particular one I was talking about, the ED mm -hmm. from Biscayco Chacolina. Um, in 2020, the region um, overhauled their um, their regulations, and this is only in Biscayco at this point. And so, uh, at the time, the only red grape, for example, that was authorized was Belza. Now, Cabernet Franc and Pinot Noir are both authorized. Wow. Um, and it makes sense, especially with, I mean, Pinot not so much, but Cab from for sure because it's a parent grape you know right. but the other thing that they did and this this wine actually falls into that category now is they have a new uh, labeling system called Beresiak Chakuli and that's for wines that are aged on the lees for five months or longer so it's now that? part of the regulations. regulations they also have additional styles that they've authorized so wines made in amphora wines made oh. uh, via carbonic maceration um they've got sparkling wines they've got late harvest and so you're seeing obviously there are producers doing this in the regions because now the, the they've done there there are enough of them that the regulations are changing to accommodate them to be able to label with the actual denomination of origin versus just labeling as vino de españa right that's a table wine so I don't think I'm sorry. I don't think no, you can you go hold, ahead. I just go don't ahead, think Lord. you can hold back it, winemakers. You know, uh, like they uh -uh. they they get it. There's regulations for a specific DO, but they're going to experiment. And if they start to experiment and it becomes a bigger thing, the DO's got to adapt to allow. Right, that you want to grow the DO, yep. right? And I think that, that that's, I mean, Biscayco Chacolina, you know, is really on the forefront of that in this part of, of, of Spain. Um, I would not be surprised to see Guitariaco follow suit very soon. Um, Guitariaco was the first DO in the Basque country, and, B, and Biscayco was the second. And, and so I would not be surprised to see, to see that happening as well. So is this widely distributed in the States? Because where I am in the land of misfits down here in South Jersey these days, <laughs> I I would never be able to find it. I mean, mine came via my UPS driver. So, I mean, and I go into the liquor store a lot looking for stuff. And I mean, is it widely distributed? Because a lot of people that are listening to this, yeah. where can they, you know, yeah. So when you go to the liquor store, Debbie, you have to move past the scotch aisle. <laughs> um, I don't drink scotch. I don't either. It was just the first thing that came to my mind. Vodka, um, but not scotch. <laughs> I'm a gin guy. Um, but uh, yeah, so I mean, it, it it is, I mean, in the bigger markets, it's absolutely available. New York, Chicago, yeah. Miami, Los Angeles, San Francisco, wherever, you know, Um it is, it, it's really, it is a little more hit and miss in the smaller markets. I mean, a lot of like wine bars, it's a really, especially in the summertime, it's a, it, you'll probably see a lot more of it like by the glass mm -hmm. because it is such a great summer wine. I mean, but I would, I mean, for me, I would say if you, I mean, and I would encourage everybody. And if you go, you find some, don't just buy one bottle. No, buy half a case or a case. You will wish you absolutely, you yes, will wish you absolutely. had more. And so, I mean. It's, I mean not it's not terribly expensive. No, generally $15. in the 15 to 20 bucks um, for a nice, I think both of these were in the 20, you know, 19 to 20 range. Okay, mine um, was under 15. Yeah. And if you're going for like some of the more esoteric ones, like the red or something, this is probably, I think was 22 or 23. Um, and then the e, the ED I think was closer to thirty. Okay. This is that Lee's You're age, whatever. Bad. But I would I would look at Wine Searcher. I mean, I live on Wine Searcher, so wine searchercom yeah. and just type in chocolate. I mean, 
you will find. And it's spelled T-X-A-K-O-L-I. <laughs> exactly. And that's the Basque language where T's and X's live next to each other on a regular basis. So. I think this is a Psalm geek alert. I think that if you, if, if you have a good Psalm in a restaurant, you're going to find a chocolate on, on the menu because it's something that they can geek out over and something that I think is enjoyable by a wine newbie mm -hmm. or somebody who yeah. is experienced with wine. It's just across the board, a very appealing style mm. of wine. Yeah, I com I completely agree, and and I think you know I would tell you if you're if you go into a into a restaurant and you see it on the glass and the bottle, I would just buy the bottle to be bottle, honest with you yeah. seriously because I mean mm -hmm. by the time you've gone through a couple glasses, you're like I duck on it. I wish I would have just bought the whole bottle because right. it's and such a crowd pleaser. It's super easy. In the summer, this will go great. All kinds of seafood, white fishes, totally. <laughs> clams, shrimp, you know. I don't do oysters, so I, but um, it would, I don't know if it has, yeah, it probably would do well with oysters. It's got that salinity. Yeah. And, and, uh, and so, I mean, you know, the, they always talk about, you know, where the wine, where the wines are made and where the vines grow mm -hmm. and you're right on the coast. And yeah. if you, you know, and you go into Basque country and you go into the, into these tavernas, um, and, and, you know, you see these, the pinchos, which is like, which are Basque tapas. So never go to a Basque restaurant and ask for tapas. Oh, okay. They're, they're pinchos, P-I-N-T-X. Here we go again. Mm -hmm. Oh, and so, um, but they're basically what they are is they're like, it's like a, it's like a tapa that's put on a piece of bread with a toothpick in it. And the way that they would do it is you would, you would go, you would pick a bunch of pinchos, you, they would count your toothpicks at the end and they would charge you based on the number of toothpicks that you had. And um, Chakali is the drink in these places. Um, so they go with the seafoods. Like um, if you're looking like a, like a crab salad or, um, you know, like with the mayonnaise and, mm -hmm. and vegetables, um, like peppers and those kinds of things. Fried and fried seafood is, as well. Mm -hmm. I had this past weekend crab ragoon grilled cheese. Oof. This would have been awesome Oof. with it. That's awesome. Yeah. And and so I mean there it's a very yeah. versatile. I mean, it's not it's yeah. not a red meat kind of a wine. No, no, no now, definitely. Now the red, good. the red, yes, because it's it's a lighter, fresher style. You could totally do that. But not um, but I mean it's just it is so versatile, especially when it comes to the sea. Um, and if you don't eat seafood, you know, like chicken or even just salads or rice dishes mm -hmm. or, you know, vegetables, those types of things. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And now it, doing a little reading on it, it said that chocolate was actually used for trading purposes. What, what, are, what are we trading to get this great wine? <laughs> so it... it <laughs> um, You know, it's funny because the chocolate actually goes back. I think the I'm trying to think the first writings were back in the 10th century of of the wine, and um, and I mean wine has has been has been a trade has been used for trade for a long time. Um, the Dutch, the English, um, were always trading, you know, wine for whether it was wool or, or whatever. And, um, there was a, there was something I wanted to read you guys. Cause it was so fun when I read it. Um, and it was back in, and this has not has to do with trade, but it has to do with how important this wine has been historically back in 1397 during the general meeting of the Gibushkwa Guild. So this is, um, uh, Guitariaco. Okay, that's the. It's they're all the same. They that um, the first bylaws of the province were approved, and item eighteen threatened anyone who destroyed the vines with the death penalty. Yes, <laughs> that's some serious stuff. There, isn't that awesome? 
That is awesome. Maybe, they all, maybe everybody who vines. keeps ripping up the ripping up the vines to plant them to Cab Sauv should be following <laughs> or Chardonnay. That. Or Chardonnay, uh, right. Which incidentally is approved in the region, but uh, Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc have been recently approved, but nobody's, you know, I don't, I don't even know why they do those things. Because, I mean, the, the Riesling is the, is the only international grape that I really see that has a home in this area. And I, you'll okay. see, you know, a lot of times you'll see Hondri Missouri blended with Zaradia. Uh, there's another one. There's another grape called Iskiriota, which is Gros Mansang from okay. France. And then you, and Riesling. And you will sometimes see those, those you know, minor, minor player, players in a blend. Um, but, but generally, I mean, this is the, it goes to show you, I mean, I mean, it really could very well try back to your question on trade, Lori, in that in, in the, you know, in the 14th century, people were, were, you know, threatened with death to pull vines up. This is, and it, what is it? I mean, it couldn't have been just a local consumption thing, you know, right. it had to be that it was agriculturally significant in the region for for survival right that that is i love that i, I do item 18 item 18. item 18 item 18 <laughs> item 18 don't touch the grapes oh my god off, off with your head <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> and i mean deb you guys kind of started it but what yeah, else what else are your food yeah uh, for 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 people like me <laughs> you know what, Laura? People like you, the vegetable, like fried rice with vegetables. Um, I can see like eggplant rollatini. Okay. You know? Um, Do you not eat that... seafood, Lori? No. Okay. Well, Lori's got a very limited palate. Um, it's okay. I mean, she lives in Fresno. I mean, it's like, yeah. but that, but that is also. But anything vegetable wise, this would go broccoli salad. Um, you know, kiwa, anything like kiwa, yeah. rice, orzo, like orzo salad with lemon in it. That would be awesome. I mean, See, I, I got to pull out that lemon, pull out that lemon in something like that. I mean, I would mean, I mean, yeah. I think that's a great, I mean, I, a lot of times I'll, I will do just like a, like pasta with some tomatoes mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, some basil and a little squeeze of lemon and extra virgin olive oil. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, I would this is definitely the more, uh, a, it's a seafood and vegetable wine. It, it very much is. Yeah. Yeah. That, absolutely. But, but I mean like a rice, um, paella or, mm -hmm. you know, um, I mean a rice paella with vegetables, Yeah. you know, would be, would be spectacular, you know, because you, you do have like, you know, the, having the, the texture of the rice, that I kind see. of full, Fullness of the rice with the really super light uh, right. chocolatey, I think, is a great combo as well. I'm wondering about because because of the acidity and stuff, I'm thinking like a risotto with some yeah. um, fresh shaved Parmesan. I don't know where, like you know yeah. I think that, that would uh, that would go well. That would yeah, be because you've got the saltiness of the Parmigiano Reggiano, right? Yeah, and you want some for, of Chef Gus's risotto? That would go well. With yeah, that. yeah. So that that that's what my mind went to. Is no, and that's great because not everybody eats seafood. I mean, I think yeah, you know, you can't assume that you know. And it's I mean, a good and uh, vegetarian wine. Yep, mm -hmm. absolutely. And I mean, and you yeah. walk into a Pincho's bar. I mean, you're going to see a lot of seafood. Trust me, but you're going to see a lot of vegetable. Like I mean, even stuff like like a tortilla, the Spanish tortilla, the egg, egg right. and potato yep. omelet. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's perfect. It's an you know, it's a great yep. appetizer or whatever, mm -hmm. and, and I mean, it's it's beautiful. Yep, that's what we made, Rick. That's what we made to celebrate me passing. Yes, the, the Spanish wine scholar. Uh, a friend of ours bought me a bottle before I knew I passed. Bought me a bottle of of um, uh, Spanish uh, Tempranillo, and uh, and so Mike made me the Spanish tortilla. And that's awesome. what we sat down and we celebrated. <laughs> we celebrated with that. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Hey, anything Spanish works for me. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Now, and you have, this can be made also, be, it's kind of a frisante, but 
can it be in an actual sparkling also? Yes, it can. <laughs> I, I told you I came with props. She has a spark. He has a sparkling. Yes. Yeah. This is the Hidusta. Uh, this is a Brut Natur. Okay. And uh, this one is from Getariaku, Chacolina as well. Hundred percent, Hundred Missouri. And um, the, I mean, it's um, traditional method. So, just like Cava, Champagne, yeah. whatever. Um, and aged on the leaves for 14 months. Wow. So like a traditional kava, for example, is nine Can months. Can we find that in the States? Yeah, I got that here. I got that. Um, I think I got this from K&L. Okay. Deb, Deb is going to be on the computer later. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's a, and it's beautiful. I mean, I, I mean, you, I mean, you know, just from tasting these, these wines too, that they're just, they're really, the acidity and they're really fresh, but it had a really nice creamy mousse to it. And it was aged for 14 months on the lees. It's all disgorged manually okay. as well. Um, and so, I mean, you don't see, uh, Amos Toy actually does make a sparkling as well. I've seen they make the white and a rosado um, of sparkling, both available in the U.S. too. So um, there's definitely, they're, they're definitely, I mean, they're very limited. Um, it's like, trying to get a sparkling wine from the Canary Islands, you know, kind of mm. thing. But, um, but yeah, they, they do, they make them. And, and they're, you know, it's part of these regulations that have been, that have been evolving over time that they're authorized styles as well to be able to carry the label of the appellation. And since they're traditional, Debbie and I can saber them. That's right. Yes. <laughs> That's a traditional method. <laughs> it is saberable. It is savorable. <laughs> That's very important to Debbie and I. Yes. <laughs> it's our addiction. <laughs> yeah. I love it though. Yes. Hey. Yes. Absolutely. I love it. <laughs> you, you'll never forget your first saber. No. no. And I've saved all my, the tops. And at the restaurant this year, I had two little Christmas trees. And that's how you use those ornaments. <laughs> oh, that's fun. Yeah. yeah. That's fun. Hopefully yeah. nobody touched them and cut their hands. Nobody but, did. Yeah. I actually did cut my hands putting it up. works good. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> well, we are actually over an hour, but yeah, is there we anything we've missed that we need to let our listeners and our viewers know about Andorabi Zuri or Pais Basco? <laughs> I mean, I think, I mean, to be honest, I mean, I mean, this is just one of those wines that, I mean, they're amazing. And when you drink them at home, they're even better when you drink them in the Basque country, in the setting. And if anybody's going to Spain, you have to put San Sebastian on your, on your to-do list. I mean, it's one of the most beautiful cities in the world for me. I am, it's, uh, but I mean, I, outside of, I mean, the, the amount of information, like we've covered a lot in this hour and um, I would just say, go online and find, um, find some of these wines and just enjoy. And if you want to learn more about this or about anything Spanish, then come take the Spanish Wine Scholar course. Um, How can they find you on that? So a um, couple different ways. So winescholarguild.org is our site where we have all of our information. You can reach reach me on Instagram um, at the Spanish Wine Guy, and um, and I'm happy to get information. We have a new class actually. The class that that Lori took uh, a year over a year ago uh, starts January 17th. So the next instructor-led course starts January 17th. Uh, reach out to me. I'll make sure you get all the info quickly so we can get a manual sent out to you. Um, but, um, I mean, you know, Lori, Lori has known me for a while when it comes to, and she's listened to me talk on, on this, and I can never talk enough about Spain. I absolutely love it. I think it's the best country in the world. And, you know, I know you guys have to cover other grapes, but <laughs> thank, you for, thank you for finding all this. night and talk to you about Spanish wine. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I'm a huge fan. 
I love it. Okay. But yeah, no, at the Spanish Wine Guy on Instagram or winescholarguild.org. Uh, and, um, and I, you know, we can get you any information that you want um, for that. And I just want to say, you know, we, we haven't gotten, or I didn't get any compensation. Debbie did the Sherry specialist thing yeah. there. There was no compensation for that. So this, this is yeah. just our true, you know, Gosh. opinion of, of it. It was, it was not an easy class. <laughs> it it's was not not Sherry me. class wasn't easy either. You know, it was not an easy class and it really made me think and study. And that was what I thought was cool was how you took, you know, we went across the country and went through each of the autonomous regions. But the bad thing is in a lot of education, it's like, okay, here's Rias Baishas. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, here's Pius Vasco. Yeah, 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 yeah. And there's no connection between them. And that's not the way the Spanish Wine Scholar Program was set up. It we we traveled the country with a yeah. connection throughout, which for somebody like me, who you know, it makes it a lot easier. And it's not something like I memorized it for the test and I forgot it. You know, I actually understand stuff. Not to say I don't have to go back to the book and look things up. <laughs> we all do. Trust but... <laughs> me. No, we all do. Trust me. But uh, thank. I mean, that's very that's very kind, Lori. I appreciate it. And. You know, I mean, we spend a lot of time creating these courses and, and you know, to your point, um, anything that's worthwhile is not easy. So, um, yeah. and it, I mean, it's great. As I mentioned at the beginning, we have a course starting in Malaga in the middle of April. We still have a few seats available for that, but I'm super excited. It's five days in um, Can in I just Spain. go with you to visit yeah. Malaga? <laughs> We're going to visit the Sherry region one day. Um <laughs> And then we're going to do a half day in, in one of the sub zones in Malaga. We'll be tasting probably 70 or 80 or more mm -hmm. wines from around Spain over the course of the of the five days that we're doing the course. So it's it's gonna be a lot of fun. But I mean, if you, if you can't do that, obviously, come and join us online. Uh, we do also have an independent study. We'll just follow uh, you on Instagram. Yeah, seriously, it's a lot easier that way. Because <laughs> I, I always talk about cl upcoming classes in particular, yeah. plus um, fun, fun little gems that I find. Um, and, and I mean, it's almost always, and they're always available in the U.S. because that's where I find them. So oh, that's good. And just for people for next month, um, next month um, date will be determined because I have some travel plans and we'll have to work it out. Um, Miss Isabella, and um, which is. No clue what that is. No it clue. isn't. Uh, it's. I know it's grown in New York, so I'm. I'm going to seek out somebody for that. <laughs> I will not be. I will not be volunteering for that one. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I have people in mind, so. Um, so stay well, tuned. Sign up for our newsletter, and we'll uh, let you know. And I just want to say thank you again, Rick. Yes. I, you know, yep. you are so generous with your time and your knowledge. And, um, you know, I'm so, I, I never, whenever I think of a Spanish grape, I know I can come to you and, <laughs> you know, you have the answers for me or whatever. So thank you so much for taking the time to, thank you. to talk about the wine with us, mm -hmm. the grape variety and the region. And, and I have to say, I love sitting here and talking to you about all these Spanish grapes because it's just, I can, we can go on for hours. No, we could. We absolutely could. And, and you know, anybody that knows me knows that that's true. So it's it's good that you have time periods that you have to watch. <laughs> yes. Thank you, because we are well over our time period. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Rick. Thank, thank, you. thank you to everybody who joined. Salud. 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 Salud.